Hello everyone, welcome to this video. If you've ever used a ruler, held it with one hand uh, at the bottom, pulled the top end over to the side and let it go, without knowing it perhaps, you performed a free vibration analysis. And we're going to actually replicate this in the digital world and understand how we can apply that to our structural analysis uh, when we're looking at dynamic effects on our structures. So I'm actually going to try to represent this in uh, the digital world representing different types of rulers here. So I've got S-Calc open here and I've got three different cross sections. I've got a rectangular cross section, you can see it 33 millimeters wide, 3 millimeters deep, and I'm calculating the moment of inertia about each axis. I've got a what I'll call a raised ridge um, ruler section. And this one has similar dimensions, at least for the bottom part, except that I've actually got a um, kind of a sloping edge to it. So I am taking a bit of material away from the sides here. And I've got this ridge in the middle uh, that is going to obviously increase the moment of inertia uh, when we're bending about that axis. And then I've got the three-sided uh, option here, which is, I would say, more symmetric in its stiffness, perhaps, uh, than the other two, uh, but more complex as well. And obviously, we've got our moments of inertia calculated uh, for each of those axes. And we're going to export this to a 1D element uh, model and look at performing a variety of different analysis. Now, as you've seen here, I've got my moments of inertia that have been calculated. So I put together this spreadsheet to compare the results that we're getting from the software to what we would get out of a hand calculation. And I'm making some assumptions when I'm doing this as well. So you'll notice here that I stated these assumptions at the top. I have a mass, which I'm assuming is going to be consistent between all these different variations. Uh, we're not going to get to that level of detail. I'm assuming that we have a 32 gram lump mass at the top of my ruler model, which is going to have two joints. We'll get into more of that later. I'm also assuming the material property set uh, for our plastic materials, as you can see here, I have my Young's and Shear modulus and a length of 300 millimeters. Now, obviously, just like we would in the real world, if we held that ruler at a different point along its length, we can change the frequency of vibration depending on where we hold it. Um, that can obviously have a big influence on this. We're assuming 300 millimeters uh, for all of them. You'll also notice down below I have a set of section properties. So these are all the different moments of inertia in the strong and weak axis of my different ruler sections. So I have my rectangular section, for example, the strong and weak axis. And you'll notice the difference in those moments of inertia that we just went into how those were determined. I also have my uh, ruler with the uh, ridge in it. And you can see here, well, first of all, we'll notice the weak axis is quite a bit stiffer for the, or has a higher moment of inertia rather for the ridge model. But if we look at the, um, the strong axis, we can see that actually the rectangular section has a little bit higher moment of inertia than the ridge section because of those sloped edges where I'm removing material from the extreme points of the section away from the centroid. And as you can see, our three-sided section has the same material, or section properties, uh, in this case, moments of inertia for both strong and weak axis. Now one thing I did mention a little bit earlier on is that it's worth noting that in our examples that we're going to be showing, uh, we're using a two node uh, model with using beam elements that have lumped stiffness versus distributed stiffness. So we may see some discrepancies between the hand calculations and the results calculated in the software, and that can obviously be mitigated uh, if we were to add additional joints to our member to better distribute the stiffness uh, along the length of that member. We didn't go into that level of detail here. However, this topic is discussed in a lot of detail in our dynamics training course. So with all this information here that we've already gone over here, we can use this to determine the stiffness uh, and I'm using the following equation as you can see here. I've taken this, uh, this image actually comes from our dynamic training course as well. Uh, but this is a similar, maybe not quite identical system to my model, uh, but it's close enough for this comparison. So we've determined the stiffness as you can see here. I've calculated it in Newton's per uh, meter, 1677. And this is actually using uh, the strong axis rectangular section. So here we can see our natural frequency of 228.9 radians per second. Uh, and again, that's in the strong axis. So you can see the difference we will get here 
If we were to change this looking at the weak axis, remember 228.9 versus the weak axis, I'm getting a much smaller frequency. So this is just looking at uh, an example of a single degree of freedom system. Um, but these concepts that we're looking at will apply to larger models as well, which in the real world will have thousands, if not millions of different degrees of freedom. For example, you saw the uh, change in my stiffness. So I reduced the stiffness and what that did was it actually decreased the numerator in this equation here, this k value. So the stiffness is reduced, uh, the frequency is also reduced, and thus my period uh, of, for the oscillation will actually increase. Now let's just look at an example here where I maintain the same moment of inertia, well effectively the same stiffness, but I change the mass. So maybe I want to increase the mass. I'm going to change it from 0 0.032 to 0 0.1 kilograms. So I'll say it's a heavier ruler. And you can see that that natural frequency has actually decreased even more. Uh, so increasing the denominator, the mass in this case, will naturally decrease the natural frequency. So our frequency reduces, our period increases. So we can see that same effect occur in real world structures if you have examples you can compare it to. Now let's look further into our model. So this model here, which I have in S Timber, if we just zoom in here, we can see the uh, cross section that's been assigned. So the strong axis of this ruler is in the direction of the y axis of our global coordinate system. This pink box indicates the fully fixed support at the base of this uh, member. And at the top, I have this mass symbol. And we can actually look at that. If I just select the joint, I can see here that I have uh, 300 or 30, 32 grams of translational lump mass in the x and y direction at that point. Now we've done this just to align with uh, our hand calculations. Obviously we don't have to apply lump mass. Uh, we could have a system mass, which means that our material has its own density and that mass is distributed throughout the model. However, this is just done to align with hand calculations, which I just showed you. So we're going to go ahead and run an unstressed vibration analysis, uh, knowing that again this is fixed at the base. We have that 32 gram mass and the uh, plastic material property and the rectangular rule section. So I'm just going to go ahead and run the analysis. I'm running an unstressed vibration analysis and I can click on the analysis options here and I can see them asking to uh, extract two different mode shapes uh, using the Jacobi threshold model. So I'll click OK, run the analysis. And we can see here in the results that we get two different mode shapes that have been calculated with quite different frequencies. It's showing them in Hertz right now. So here I can see by animating this, the first mode is showing me uh, oscillation in the weak axis. And this has a lower frequency, which makes sense. It will have a longer period. It is more flexible in that direction. And in the second mode, it's going in the other direction because I have those lump masses at the top. I'm able to control which mass is participating in which uh, direction. And I can go into the spreadsheet view here and I can also see the results in numerical uh, representation as well. So here I can maybe I'll just show all of them at the same time. I can see my period of vibration and the natural frequency uh, that's occurring for both. And you may know, notice here that in the uh, strong axis of our ruler, uh, we have our angular frequency of 223 radians per second. I calculated by hand about 228. Uh, there is some round off uh, associated with that result. So I can think that that's quite close to what we were getting and what we're expecting, which is a nice comparison that we have. Now let's just recall these values here, uh, 0.3 in the strong axis or in the weak axis uh, for our period and 0 0.028 in the, the strong axis. And what we can do is we can change this section. So I can go from the rectangle section here to my ridge section. And you can see now I've added that ridge in the middle and this is repeat that process of running the analysis. Once again, we can see our oscillations in the direction of each mode shape that it's participating in each axis. And I can scroll down here through my results and look at all of my modes and I can see here for my first mode, uh, the period actually did decrease a little bit. Uh, and for my second mode, 
uh, you can see here the natural or the angular frequency that we get at 215 uh, radians per second. So these values are relatively close to what I had for the previous example. Uh, my periods have actually increased a little bit uh, for the strong axis because what I'm doing is I'm actually with those sloped edges I'm taking a little bit of the the mass and the material away from the points furthest from my centroid of my uh, section in the strong axis. So I'm actually reducing the moment of inertia uh, in the strong axis here a little bit. But in the weak axis, you can see that my period is actually quite a bit less than it was. I think it's about uh, half of what it was because I've added that ridge, which is obviously contributing to the stiffness in that direction. And let's change this one more time. What I'll do here is I'm going to go with my three-sided uh, section, as you can see the angle uh, array that we have there. I'm going to go ahead and run the analysis again. And looking at these sections, uh, or and looking at these results here, I can see in the frequency uh, spreadsheet that I'm getting identical frequencies and periods in both directions, which makes sense. I have the same moments of inertia in both directions. I should also note that uh, in my model, if we just look at the final element model, I am just looking at uh, essentially a node at the top and no nodes in between the support and the top. Uh, if we wanted to be more accurate, we could always add additional nodes along the length of the member. However, we weren't going to, uh, we didn't go down that approach for this example. For more details, we have a separate training course on dynamic analysis, which talks more about discretizing your model and different mode shapes and how that can actually affect the results. But let's just go back to our ruler uh, with the rectangular section model. And let's remind ourselves of the frequency uh, vibration that we have. So we have uh, basically 223 radians per second or 35.5 hertz in the strong axis. It leads to a period of vibration of 0 0.0281 seconds. Again, if I wanted to just animate this, I could show that as well. Make sure I select the right mode shape. And we can see the direction that that's going. A one way to validate this besides the hand calculations that we've already run, and we can see here that we're getting a nice agreement with, I can also look at actually applying uh, that same type of approach that I showed in the video where we actually just move the side or the top of our ruler to the side and let it go. I can do that uh, through the simulation as well. So I have a separate model that's identical to this one with the exception here that rather than running an unstressed vibration analysis, I'm actually applying a, an initial condition. So this initial condition that I'm applying is actually going to uh, help me set up uh, an initial displacement on the top of the model uh, at where this joint load location is. So at this joint load location, I've got this joint dynamic load applied, uh, and I'm not actually defining any uh, forcing function curve, but what I'm doing here is in the translation y direction, I'm specifying a initial condition of one centimeter, uh, which is basically pushing this top of the member, this joint, one centimeter in the y-axis, and then letting it go once the analysis starts. And I can go ahead and run the analysis. So I'll go run ahead, uh, the analysis, I've got the dynamic time history analysis where I've set this up to solve with a fairly tight time step size, a small time step size and a large number of time steps because I want to make sure that I capture that oscillation which has a fairly high frequency. So I need small time step sizes and a lot of them to capture that behavior. So I can click OK and run my analysis. And if I just animate this, I can see how this is oscillating. It looks very much similar to the vibration analysis results, which is a good thing, but that wasn't the intention of what we we're trying to show you here. Instead, what I'm going to go to is the joint results in the design output and look at joint number two. And here I can see the displacement plot. I should note that we don't have any damping, which in the example that I was showing, my hand holding that ruler is going to provide some damping as well as the other materials uh, in the example. So this is an idealized example, but let's just focus here on the results. You can see that it's starting with a displacement of uh, 10 millimeters or one centimeter. 
and it's returning to the equilibrium position, but then it's overshooting it, and it's going back to a displacement of 10 millimeters, and then just basically oscillating about that uh, equilibrium point. And what I'm interested in here is actually looking at the time it takes to oscillate through one whole period here. So it starts at the uh, 10 millimeters, and I want to see where it hits that point again. You can see it's right around 0 0.03 seconds. I can actually scroll through this table here, and I should be able to find a more precise value. So here I can see that I'm getting a, a quite close here at 0 0.0282 seconds. And just to remind ourselves, let's just go back to uh, the original model we were working with, and we can see here the period of 0 0.0281 seconds. So they are effectively the same. Again, the value that I showed uh, was at point, or 9.994 uh, millimeters, not 10 millimeters exactly. So we can say that they effectively are the same as a good validation of our results. And the reason we might want to know this information is because this same concepts can also apply to buildings and other structures that we might have. A high-rise building will act a lot like a uh, ruler would uh, when it's uh, we're looking at its dynamic properties. And that information is important. Obviously, we're going to have a lot of mode shapes that we need to calculate, but these natural frequencies are also very important for things like response spectrum analysis, time history analysis, so where we line up on that response spectrum curve, uh, what our dominant mode shapes are, and um, also, when we're looking at trying to avoid resonance, if we have an unbalanced motor motion or some type of uh, oscillation uh, in our structure, we want to make sure that we don't align with the natural frequency of our structure to avoid resonance from occurring and having those dynamic uh, effects being magnified. So hopefully you found this valuable. We do have plenty of more information on this topic in our dynamic analysis training course and our seismic analysis training course, which are also available through the Altair 1 learning management system.